Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have a very special episode today. We have Joseph Selby. If you followed the podcast for a long time, you know I love to talk about physics and the psychology of the brain and its limits. And Joseph Selby is on the very forefront, one of the best authors on these subjects and much more. Joseph Selby is the author of The Physics of God and an avid follower of the unfolding new paradigms of science. He is now uh, known for creating bridges of understanding between modern evidence-based discoveries of science and the ancient experience-based discoveries of the mystics. He, a dedicated Kriya meditator for nearly 50 years, he has taught yoga and meditation throughout the U.S. and Europe, helped people to understand and find their own spiritual potential, and helping them understand how the expression of their spiritual potential ushers into the world an unstoppable wave of peaceful consciousness. He is also the author of The Protector's Diaries, a science fiction fantasy series, and uh, The Yugas, a factual look at India's tradi tradition of cyclical history. And most importantly, he has just published a new book in September, uh, Break Through the Limits of the Brain. So much stuff to talk about. Thank you for coming on. Welcome to the Reality Revolution, Joseph. Well, thanks for having me. So um, you're, the first book I really wanted to talk about is The the Physics of God. This is a groundbreaking book. Anybody that has a foot in, in this world of physics and science, but also a foot in the world of spirituality, can see that there's a common denominator, this amazing common denominator that the actual physics that we're looking into is really proof that God exists and an understanding of the nature of God. And, and so let's start with that. I just wanted to get your inspiration in, in writing about the physics of God. Well, I had met so many people, and I was myself one of them when I was younger, who were really convinced that uh, God was not a possibility, that uh, spiritual awareness was just something that people were making up, and that it was... Uh, you know, at best superstition, at worst fraud. And that was the way I was raised. But I had my own uh, deep experience of realities beyond what anything that I had been told science supported uh, in, a, in a psychedelic experience while I was in college. And it wasn't my first psychedelic experience, and it wasn't my last, but it was by far and away, the most moving, the most life-changing. Uh, I felt myself to be like the best self I had ever been. I was clear, I was calm, I was kind, I was thoughtful for days uh, after this experience. And my inner experience was just wonderful. So this put me on a path of trying to figure out what had I experienced and how can I keep experiencing it you know how can i bring that back and i knew because i had been on all these other psychedelic uh trips that psychedelics weren't reliable it wasn't just a matter of taking more or taking it again or taking it in a certain environment uh there was just too much variability there so that got me connected to meditation and that got me connected to the teachings of paramahansa yogananda uh, author of the autobiography, The Yogi. And that step-by-step step, led to me becoming part of the Ananda communities, and Ananda movement in, in America. And all through those steps and all through my time being a part of Ananda, which has been a wonderful experience, I never lost touch with the kind of scientific roots that my uh, family instilled in me. You know, my father was a uh, Princeton graduate, and my brother was an engineer from Georgia Tech, and I had uh, other relatives who were doctors. So it was kind of in my DNA to have this kind of strong mind and very rational scientific approach to things. So I never really lost that. And I was extremely pleased to find that in the teachings of Yogananda, for those people who have read the autobiography of a yogi, you probably already know that he back in the 19, late 40s, when he was writing it, um, came out in 1946, 
he was already drawing parallels between uh, relativity and spiritual experience. And there's he devoted an entire chapter to it. So this was like the clincher, you know. I fell in love with <laughs> with these teachings because Yogananda included science, and he actually described many things in a scientific way. And he drew on medicine, he drew on psychology, he drew on physics, and so that really was a great fit for me. And then it was only later in life, after I'd had a family, raised my kids kids were grown and gone, that I had a chance to put those two sides together that you talked about, the, the scientific, the one foot in, in physics and the scientific method and the other foot in spiritual experience. And that really is what the physics of God is. It was the marriage of those two experiences. And it was kind of the fruits of thoughts I'd had for decades about, you know, what is it that makes people think there is a separation between science and religion? And what are the key things, the key intersections that uh, explain the deeper connection between the two? One of my favorite chapters in, in the physics of God is the light show illusion of matter uh, just resonates with me because you get the sense and idea that everything is light and everything is the same substance um that we can eventually at some point may perhaps monitor and but it's it's sort of an illusion um uh, based upon our own sensory per perception of this light um so talk a little bit more about that what what we see around us as matter what is your impression of it is it the same substance is it light is it you know how with your expanded understanding of physics how do we describe this to a layman who just thinks, hey, we just walk around in a physical universe, not understanding the power of light and what it means in our environment? Well, this was one of the you know early revolutionary um, discoveries in physics, and it was pioneered by Einstein, who came up with the famous equation E equals MC squared that probably everybody in the world has seen, uh, perhaps don't know exactly what it means, but it's a condensation of the reality that all matter is condensed energy and that it's energy uh, held in uh, repeating patterns. So uh, an atom is surrounded by electrons that, that rotate around the sphere of the, the atom uh, perpetually. They're held there by the attraction of the nucleus and the nucleus in turn is made up of moving energy and it can be broken down into many, many parts, each one of which is itself energy. And no matter how far you break it down, no matter how many CERN colliders you have, large hadron colliders like they have in Switzerland, you're never gonna find some irreducibly small bit of matter, it's all energy. So there's an old saw that people have probably heard that if you took all the space out of the human body, if you took all the space that is between the orbiting electrons and the tiny, tiny little nucleus at the center of the atom, our entire body could be reduced to the size of the head of a pin. <laughs> and even that bit, impossible to actually concentrate in that way, but even that small bit, would still be energy, just super condensed energy. So everything we interact with, everything we see with our senses is essentially energy, but it also behaves like matter. There's a real, uh, there's a reality to matter. It's not that it is an illusion in the sense that it's, you know, like a mirage. Rather, it's an illusion in the sense that it's not what it seems. So all of matter is not what it seems. It, it seems like this solid, permanent, heavy substance, when in fact, it's energy masquerading as uh, matter. So you take a giant step back from that and you look at the entire physical universe and it is a giant energy machine that 
uh, there's these, you know, uncountable number of stars that are all themselves energy putting out energy and so forth. So you can see it from that perspective that everything we experience is this illusion of energy. It's the dance of energy masquerading as matter, but it does it in a lawful way. It's not capricious and therefore uh, we have to behave in it in these bodies made of matter as if that illusion you know was real a yogananda put it this way if you uh hit your dream head on a dream wall it will hurt <laughs> you know right. we're built with with nerves connected to all that illusory matter and therefore we're sensitive to it so it's just not what it seems it's real it's lawful but it's not what it really seems now, with so much space between the particles, as you described, what do you define as the space? Does, does the space have dynamics? Is it fluid or is it just space? Is the space the the God, also God and also substance? Or, you know, talk to me a little bit more of your impressions of what you've learned about the space between these particles. And there's just massive amounts of space everywhere, right? There are massive amounts of space in that three-dimensional universe. But underlying all of our universe is a deeper well of pure energy. And that well of pure energy is what string theory has basically posited uh, not only might exist, but must exist mm -hmm. to account for the behavior of quantum particles that can uh, sort of come into being uh, when observed, they have to come from somewhere. They have to. There has to be this foundation of energy to support three-dimensional uh, universe, the three-dimensional universe that that we inhabit. But that underlying reality has no matter, and therefore it has no space, and therefore it also has no distance. This is very hard for our minds to take in because we're so used to operating in a three-dimensional world. But the, the point that I'm getting to here in answer to your question is that space is an inherent part of three-dimensional reality and that uh, it isn't nothing, but it behaves like nothing almost in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if we could have a tiny little probe, <laughs> which we can't, and poke it in past the electrons on an atom, it wouldn't encounter anything because that probe is still operating under the same laws of uh, space and energy and matter that the atom is itself. But space is not truly empty. The, the vast regions of space between all of the stars and planets and the rest of the universe is according to quantum theory, uh, a kind of a seething ocean of invisible energy of rings and strings in string theory. And that at any given time, uh, millions, billions, trillions of uh, oppositely charged particles spring into being and then annihilate each other and disappear. And this is where the phrase quantum foam came from. The notion that this empty space is really a, a seething foam of energy, but it's energy operating at such high frequencies that we can't measure it. And so again, what we see is not really what it seems. Another eye-opening chapter in the physics of God uh, is that heaven is a hologram. And, and you go into description about the holographic principle. And so I'd love to get some better understanding. You kind of explained that light energy interacting with a two-dimensional hologram in a two-dimensional brain results in a colossal three-dimensional projection. So light is is pushing onto some sort of two-dimensional space. Is that space a black hole? 
and that's projecting out a three-dimensional we're interacting in a three-dimensional but it seems like it's being projected so can can you clarify or help expand on that a little bit sure uh that's one of my favorite topics uh in in regard to where uh spirituality and science intersect and right. it's exactly in this area um a lot of how I understand it is based on the current conceptions that are known as M theory. So mm -hmm. M theory is one of the string theories. So it it too posits this vast uh, well, this vast ocean, this vast realm of pure energy. But M theory gives it a little more structure, which you were alluding to, that there are these layers known as brains. Now brain is spelled B R A N E, and, yeah. uh, not and and it's confusingly similar to you know the brain up here, but it is really meant to be just a uh, a way of describing layers of or regions of this vast energy verse that are all sharing the same energy frequency, and then you have another or at least energy density, if not all the same frequency. And then there's another layer above that that is higher frequency and therefore higher density and another layer beyond that. Um, it's very easy for us to talk about, you know, layers being below and above and, uh, but in a realm like we're describing where there is no space and there is no distance, there's sort of also no there <laughs> you know there's right. no there's no higher and lower so these are difficult to visualize in fact i would say they're impossible to visualize <laughs> uh but there is this amazing conformance between this notion of higher layers of brains that have a, a increasing frequency and density of energy that basically are what the layer is conforms wonderfully to the description of almost every religion of heavens. Now, in our sort of simplified Christian view of uh, spiritual teachings, there's heaven. You know, you're going to die and you're going to go to heaven. But even within Christianity, you will find references to there being different layers of heaven. There's the highest heaven, the seventh heaven. There's the third heaven referred to in the Bible. And in um, Muhammad's life, he was taken up to the heavens while his body slumbered. And he went through seven different heavens, each one increasingly more subtle, each one increasingly more uh, refined and spiritual. In the teachings of Hinduism, you find that lokas and in many traditions, there are seven lokas uh, with the same kind of structure. The lowest level has the least energy density. It's more uh, gross compared to the layer above it and so on. And the Buddhists have it. So it, it's pretty much in every major religious tradition, you have this idea that not only are there heavens, but there are layers of heavens. And it's almost irresistible. Well, it was irresistible for me mm -hmm. <laughs> to to put these two together, to put the notion that M theory is putting out of these uh, layers of brains. Uh, to me, it, it, it simply came down to M theory gave us finally a persuasive location for the heavens. Right. That there, that there is a real place that physics can posit that could incorporate this uh, what is often thought of as just, you know, fantasy thinking of heavens, there could actually be a reality there. And the way near-death experiencers uh, describe heaven is they also say that uh, even though you appear to be embodied and your body is very much like the body you had before you died in their near-death experience, they know that it's finer and more subtle and that it's made of energy. And they also have uh, describe experiences where they're being guided to explore uh, parts of the, the heavens. And 
they'll request, well, I, I want to go there. I want to go to that mountaintop. And they begin walking and then they're there. Mm -hmm. That there really is no distance. It's just they had to go through the intention in a way of just getting to that point. And then they were there. And many near-death experiencers describe this feeling that there are different frequencies of energy they're experiencing as they go from one level of heaven to another. So it's a very, very wonderful match. My In my favorite teachings of Yogananda, Yogananda's uh, teacher, Sri Teshwar, said that in this heavenly state or astral state, as it's known also, uh, people are coordinated images of light. So this connection between M theory and the heavens also opens up another really fascinating possibility, which is the one that you started with, which is this uh, holographic connection between these heavenly layers and our physical world. So in uh, spiritual teachings, hermetic teachings, there is this phrase, as above, so below, that there are uh, correspondences between these different layers of what is actually appearing in them. And so part of that teaching is that the physical universe is a creation of the first and lowest layer of heaven, that the first and lowest layer of heaven acts as the template for the physical universe. And this is, you'll find this in all, all teachings, that, mm -hmm. that the heavens and earth are created from these higher forces. So in M theory, they came to the conclusion, and not just as a idle speculation, but they came to the conclusion that it's necessary for there to be a mechanism for these pure energy brains to have created the physical universe. And they began to speculate that the natural laws, uh, the templates, uh, the forms, some of the essentials of how our physical universe works actually originate in that energy verse, in those brains, and that there is a holographic process of creation, according to, again, according to M theory. And it's very central to their whole theory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, their whole theory falls apart if there is not this. Uh, holographic connection. So again, irresistibly for me, I put this together with the hermetic teachings and other teachings which say the earth and uh, our entire world is created through this mechanism uh, that originates in heaven for this layer. And there are each layer of heaven above it creates the layer below it. This fits exactly what M theory came up with, which is that there exists in this ocean of energy, in the lowest brain, a hologram. And it is this hologram combined with these high frequency energies of the energy verse of this vast realm of energy project the physical universe into being that is a three dimensional expression. And right. this also fits how holograms work on Earth, how we know about holograms. The hologram that creates the three-dimensional uh, object, whatever it is, you know, if you've been to Disneyland, it's it's a ghost, right? The three-dimensional ghosts appear on their rides and stuff. But the actual film that laser light is put through to create that three-dimensional ghost is actually flat, it's a two-dimensional mm -hmm. film. So that same principle is what is being, you know, vastly expanded by M-theory into this notion that there's a two-dimensional 
hologram that exists in these vast energy realms that has the coordinated images, let's call it that, that can then become through that holographic projection mechanism, become the physical universe. And there are many implications to this that are just uh, mind boggling. One is, and perhaps the most significant, is it suggests that our entire universe is continuously created, not right. just once, not just some big bang, and then unfolds according to its own inherent laws into uh, what we know today, but that the entire physical universe is still being created by this projection mechanism. So this is fascinating on many levels, but a very significant and personal level for it is, is it also suggests that our physical body is a holographic projection. And that we have an energy body that is the hologram. Right. So it means we are in our expanded self continuously creating our physical body. And there's another portion of us that's separate that's projecting ourselves. Is yes. That... Well, it's not even really separate right. that the the layers of reality that make up our soul match the layers of reality of creation. So we have a physical body, we have a subtle energy body, we have an even more subtle thought body, and then we have our innate connection, our innate reality as spirit, as the the, the actual being that we are that inhabits these bodies, uses these bodies, but ultimately we are formless, infinite, one with infinite God. And the, the, as Yogananda described it, the ever new joy, the ever new bliss mm -hmm. that is God is, is our true nature. And we have uh, inhabited these various bodies for lots of different reasons, but we're always in them. So the body that is uh, you know, nearest the physical body, if you will, the astral body, the energy body, we're still driving it. We're, we're operating it all the time. And we just don't know it. We tend to only be aware right. of our physical body. And then because we're only aware of our physical body, because we're caught up in what the senses tell us, uh, we behave as if this is it. You know, we are just physical bodies and we can have physical experiences and we begin to take for granted that there couldn't be anything beyond that. But that is belied by near-death experiencers, uh, the testimony of the saints, uh, psychic experience that people have, that there is another realm that it's possible to be aware of, that our consciousness can be aware not just of the physical body but of other more subtle realities simultaneously and that we are as i like to put it and put it in all my books we are so much more than we know <laughs> we are just so yeah. much more than we know and we can we can change that that's kind of the whole focus of my my new book break through the limits of the brain is uh, to encourage everybody to to meditate, to get past this uh, physical light show, uh, firework show that's going on in your brain and uh, realize the, the, the deeper realities that are always there, that have always been, that are, that are you. Yeah. So one thing I talk a lot about on my podcast, we, we do research on um, different channelings and uh, throughout history going all the way back a lot of them talk about us moving into a different density um, shifting our either either our individual consciousness as we awaken or ascend or group consciousness as like the globe starts to move into a higher density so is it possible based on what you're saying that you could have a group consciousness where the locus of consciousness sort of shifts into a different density or different brain as you might call it 
Is that is that something that's as we expand our understanding of the brain, suddenly our consciousness is in a is is we perceive a different world than what we're in in this in this world that we're existing in now. Yes, we definitely perceive uh, another world. I mean, uh, people who can astral travel or people who have had near death experiences, you know, they really are uh, in another realm in terms of how it looks to them and how they perceive it. And But that realm, this is the part of what blows people's minds because it is two dimensional and because it has no space and no distance, interpenetrates all of physical matter. Mm -hmm. And that's part of how the, the mechanism of holographic creation is working, is that uh, if you want to think of your astral body as the film and your physical body as the projection, imagine there's no distance between them, that that energy is just coming right into manifestation as your physical body. So we're always tapped into higher energy, but it's really a lot of what you're talking about is what you're choosing to perceive. So if I'm in a good meditation and I've managed to get my body still and my mind quieted and focused, I start to experience more of what I am. I start to experience myself as higher energy. I start to experience myself uh, as this greater joy. I start to have inspiration and creativity comes to me in that state. And my, therefore, my energy level, my degree of frequency has gone up. So I would say all of us are being asked to increase uh, the frequency at which we live, the frequency at which we operate. Uh, and it's uh, it's very possible because we're in a fairly low level of frequency most of the time. So moving forward is is natural to us. It's not like we have to do some really weird, complicated thing in order to <laughs> become this higher energy expression. We just have to take the time to get quiet and get centered and go into it. Now, there are psychics who can just sit down and go into it. There are channelers who can just sit down and go into it, that they have developed this gift where they are there. And of course, what makes a saint a saint is that they can go to it at will also. Uh, and saints can go into trances, yogis can go into trances and experience the same thing that near-death experiencers experience. They can go into other higher realms by just essentially quieting their body so completely that it's no longer breathing and its heart is no longer beating. And it might as well be dead, right? It's the same thing right. as a near-death experiencer. And I know that Yogananda will. I know that Yogananda mentions a sort of place where you're um it's an inner breath where you're not really breathing anymore. Like you might not even perceive it. If you were to come upon there's an inner breathing, like a stillness that goes do, do you know what I'm referring no, to? No, I understand what you're saying. He would call yeah. that the uh, the subtle energy of the in moving in the spine, up and down, mm -hmm. and that's uh, his main technique that he brought from India, and really was, you know, the focal point of his mission, uh, Kriya Yoga. Kriya works with that subtle energy, gets it right. moving upward into the subtle brain, into the subtle mind. And it's a, it's a very effective technique, but it works with that subtle energy. And the more you tune into the subtle breath, as he would describe it, the more natural physical breathing begins to subside. And that's, that's how you transcend the physical body. Now, I'm not uh, explaining this from direct personal experience. Uh, it, it's a fairly advanced mm -hmm. yogi who can do this where they literally can take their body to a kind of stasis and leave it 
indefinitely. Uh, there are people who can, um, you know, lie down as if sleeping in an astral travel. Uh, I don't know what condition their body actually is in. It may be breathless. It may be uh, without heart rate, but I've never heard that. Um, but at any rate, there, there are lots of examples of people having this experience and then coming back to the physical world and operating again through a physical body. So how this raises the energy level of the entire world is, I think, an, a, an interesting question. I think that anyone who meditates or anyone who has a uh, inspired experience of higher consciousness radiates new energy out into the world instantaneously and to every corner of the world, to every atom. So I think it's literally possible for people who band together and are determined to raise their own consciousness that they uplift mankind in very significant ways. Yeah. I also think, and it's part of um, the book I wrote called The Yugas, that mankind as a whole is on an upward trend uh, of advancement. Now, it's very uh, slow in comparison to what you can do on your own that this cycle of the yuga is, is 24,000 years long and the upward arc from the lowest state of mankind to the highest point of mankind is 12,000 years. And according to uh, Sri Teshwar, again, the teacher of Yogananda, uh, we are about 1,500 years into that upward arc. And so we have you know, almost 10,000 more years, more than 10,000 years to go to the peak. So I, I think that the consciousness of mankind is gradually expanding and it's, you know, it's caused by a subtle outside force that uh, affects all mankind equally. So I think that's happening. And simultaneously, I think there are uh, groups of people, pockets of people, and I would even say disconnected groups of people who are nonetheless all seeking spiritual experience in one way or another are elevating everyone uh, on earth through that, through their own elevation. I would agree. Now you dedicate the beginning of your new book, um, several chapters to the superconscious, the superconscious potential superconscious self and God. Tell me a little more about what you would determine as the superconscious and how I might be able um, to access my superconscious potential. So I chose to use the term superconsciousness because it has one very important implication to it, uh, or at least for me, it implies it, that if we are all inherently superconscious because we are part of spirit, and spirit is consciousness everywhere, intelligent consciousness everywhere, and we are a part of that, it means we're heirs to having that level of awareness where we know everything. Hard to even begin to fathom mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that we could be, you know, uh, have that kind of awareness, but we are heirs to, uh, God and God has that capability and so do we. So that's kind of the end point. And meanwhile, we have the consciousness that we have now, which uh, I'd like to describe just for sake of making it easy, is everyday consciousness that is confined to what the senses reveal and how we interact with others and uh, how we do and operate in this uh, physical world that, that we find ourselves. And that, that creates the conscious mind. But because we are inherently super conscious, we can expand that by degrees. It's not either or, we're neither fully super conscious nor not super conscious at all. Super consciousness is 
an ever expanding potential for us that as we reach toward it, we grow, we become more than we are now. We become more aware. We feel more of that divine connection, uh, that inherent joy that is us, that is the spirit. And that super consciousness is our, um, our destiny. And we will gradually, but uh, inevitably grow in greater and greater awareness. So we can, this is all the, the consciousness that we're experiencing is, is limited by the conduit of our brain, essentially, and the, and the senses that we have within it. And really that book that your most recent book is, is sort of breaking through the limits of this brain that we, that, that is right now, while we're in this body, the kind of limit to our, or our perceived limit to our consciousness. So you emphasize in the book meditation um, and relaxation as ways to go beyond or transcend the limitations of the brain, correct? Yeah, so the brain the brain is our friend and the brain is our enemy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so without the brain, uh, we would have to basically proceed with every action in the world as if we were doing it for the very first time, uh, which would mean that mankind as a whole would die out really fast. <laughs> right. Uh, so interest, it, it was fascinating to me to learn, I had heard this in the past, but to, to have it reaffirmed and to begin to understand why a little bit better, that human infants are the most helpful, helpful, um, helpless of all creatures on earth that we have almost no instinctive abilities. You know, there were arguments put forward that maybe it's just being able to suck so that you can get uh, nutrition is the only instinctive thing that we know how to do. Right. And so we start out as infants in this help, it's helpless state. And, you know, we can see the adults around us and we can see that they're doing things and we start to try to mimic it. And in the process, the brain starts creating neural circuits that connect our actions. So walking is perhaps the most interesting of those processes because uh, once we're adults, the circuit we created as an infant, you know, that, that supported walking, supports our walking today. It's the same, it's the same circuit. We built it, we keep using it. And that circuit fires uh, and sends information to hundreds of muscles in the body and coordinates the firing of those muscles so that you've got left and right moving in the uh, synchrony that they need to be in. Arms move, body does everything it needs to do in order to walk. And that circuit is made up of millions of connections to muscles, other circuits, other parts of the brain. It's fascinating, and we built it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, it made me realize that not everybody walks the same. You've probably, you know, seen this or you know noticed. Wow, that's a peculiar walk that person has. I think they are all left over from the way in which we first learned to walk. Exactly. And we just kept using that for the rest of our life. So this is the good side of the brain. The brain will obligingly create neural circuits that support everything that we do repeatedly. And so we get circuits that help us talk. We get circuits that, uh, you know, do every motor, every muscular thing that there is to do that we want to do. And then we have this complete set and it supports us for the rest of our life. But the brain also creates circuits that support all of our mental and emotional experiences. So if we listen to a song and we really <clears throat> liked it, the next time we hear that song and like it, the brain will begin to build a circuit that says, oh, let's help our, our being here 
like this music. We're going to uh, make it easier for him or her to like this music when it's played. And eventually, when you hear that song, you really like it. It changes how you feel. It changes your emotional experience. It creates a whole chain of memories about how many times you've heard this song and in what situations. And that is all courtesy of the automatic firing of this uh, neural circuit that we uh, was built by our brain to support the fact that we had already really liked this song. So multiply that by a million of all the things that we like and don't like. And gradually, as we become adults and as we become older, we become reaction machines. We become yeah. almost automatons. <clears throat> Circuit Only zombies. Because we, <laughs> what's that? Circuit zombies, right? Circuit zombies, yeah. <laughs> but because we built these... Um, these circuits, not directly, but indirectly by doing them, we keep thinking, oh, I'm choosing to do this. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, we're really not choosing any longer. It's just happening and we're going along with it. And this is when our brain is not our friend, is when any stimulus that comes along uh, from the senses or from other memories we're recalling or other thoughts we're having, that stimulates one of these circuits, that circuit fires and takes over. And then we do that. And then that stimulates another circuit and that fires and takes over. And we do that. And that can be our day from when we get up to when we go to bed is we've just followed all these circuits that we've created. Now we might think that was a great day because we heard our favorite song four times and we, you know, whatever it is, we got the right food that we like, but we just don't realize the degree to which our responses to those things are driven by automatic circuits in the brain. And we will realize it when we try to change, right? Right. You know, we've built a whole bunch of circuits that just absolutely adore uh, chocolate ice cream with, with chocolate cake. And every time we do it, we just love that experience and it releases dopamine and it's, you know, we just really look forward to it. And then at some point in our life, we realize, oh, <laughs> you know, eating chocolate ice cream or chocolate cake every day is probably not good for my health. And it's certainly not good for my waistline. And we say, okay, I'm going to stop doing that. But you're up against this amazingly well, uh, interpenetratingly woven neural circuit in the brain that the least hint of the smell of chocolate or the sight of chocolate cake or the thought of chocolate cake fires the whole circuit. Mm -hmm. And when it fires the whole circuit, it makes it almost irresistible to eat chocolate cake and ice, chocolate ice cream. And this is a big challenge. So this is the way the brain works for better and for worse. We need it or we couldn't function in this domain in which we live. But it all it starts to take over. So what do we do? What do we do is we deliberately rewire the brain. We deliberately uh, do things repetitively in order to create new neural circuits that support behaviors and emotional responses uh, and trains of thought and chains of memory that we want. And the first and foremost, most important uh, thing to do is to meditate. Right. It's meditation is not just this thing we do, like uh, you know, I like taking a walk. Meditation opens the door to super consciousness. So rather than say, "I'm going to meditate every day," you might say, "I'm going to plug into super consciousness every day." Sounds better, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And that's really what you're doing by learning to meditate. It's a it's a portal. It's an opening. It gets you into that higher level of consciousness because meditation calms down the body, calms down the mind. And as soon as they are calmed, as soon as this firework show storm of reactions and actions that are propelling us through our day by these circuits, instead of that continuously happening, Meditation calms us down. And as soon as it calms us down, we go, ah, oh, 
this feels great. This feels wonderful. And you have those moments when your heart relaxes and you go, ah, okay, I can let go of all those things that were keeping me tense today. And then the joy increases and the peace increases. And all the while this is happening, your brain is going, oh, my, my spirit likes this. Let's build circuits to support that experience. Mm -hmm. And so not only does meditation become easier to do because you have the neural circuit that supports that, the experiences you have while in meditation, the super conscious experiences also get support from these neural circuits. And so you can have the best of both worlds if you can be uh, deliberate about rewiring the brain. You can have the best of both worlds where you have all the circuits you need to behave well, successfully, uh, interestingly, in the physical world that is what we're most aware of, but you can also have circuits that can take you into deeper superconscious awareness at will. Yeah. So the brain has that power at a certain point for um, advanced, you know, practitioners, they really transcend the brain altogether. They operate at a level that they're no longer really using the brain. And interestingly enough, even though the brain is this useful friend and foe, useful friend and difficult foe, there is evidence that we don't even really need our brain to function in this world. One of the more fascinating things that I ran into was a, a study done by a, a professor, John Lorber, who uh, examined the lives of 60 people who had advanced hydroencephalitis, or what we know as uh, water on the brain. Mm -hmm. And they, as children, they had received treatment for their um, hydroencephalitis, and then they were never checked again. And what he discovered, there's a certain percentage, and it was the 60 uh, adults that he found, who were never cured, but went on to live mostly normal lives. And that one fellow that he examined was a mathematician who had an IQ of 136, but he only had 5% of the brain tissue that an ordinary brain wow. would have given him. 5%. Right. And yet he still functioned. And it, I think, I think the explanation there is that our it's our non-local mind, it's our non-local. Uh, astral body, our non-local energy body that do, is doing most of the driving, right? Mm -hmm. it's, right. The, it's the origin of our thoughts. It's the origin of our memories. Uh, and the brain only stimulates them. The brain doesn't store the memories, doesn't have the ability to do the thoughts, doesn't create consciousness. All that lies beyond the brain anyway. And so the brain is just a switchboard, a switchboard. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the, the neural circuit fires and it says, okay, part of this firing is this memory, but all it's doing is stimulating that memory in your non-local energy body, in your hologram template for the physical body. And so you don't really need the brain. All right. We so our memories, could you also make the argument that our memories are not in our brain, that, that our oh, memories yes. are in that non-local mind or the universal mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, Prebram, uh, Professor Prebram in Stanford mm -hmm. uh, worked with uh, David Bohm, uh, a, a uh, quantum oh, yeah. physicist. And they did a lot of research based on some of the holographic information that was coming out of physics and that David Bohm was really interested in. And they determined that um, memory is not stored in any one place in the brain right and that any part of the brain can stimulate certain memories 
And they said the only way that this can be so is if memory exists non-locally. Uh, if it you know exists basically beyond the local physical neurons of the brain. So there is a lot of evidence to support that um, memory, thoughts are non-local, uh, but even emotions are mm -hmm. non-local. And that this very much fits the sort of classic definition of what the energy body is composed of in the you know teachings of yoga. The energy body is composed of mind, thought, emotion, and memory. That's really what it is. That's what gives it its form. And th that we're only uh, aware of those things because we're simultaneously non-local all the time. We're existing in that non-local body all the time because it interpenetrates. It's just sandwiched together, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, it is everywhere present in this physical body, but it exists at a higher frequency and it exists in two-dimensionality only. Impossible and as you visualize, I've tried to visualize it, but right. there's just you, no you, way to visualize it. And as you make the argument in the book, uh, you're you, you never really dead because your body may die, but your your consciousness is in that non non local mind, so it would just naturally shift to that non local mind, right? Yeah, well, it doesn't even shift. It doesn't it's shift. There. It's already there, right? Yeah. So when you drop the physical body, um, many near death experiencers have had this experience where they don't realize they're dead right because you know if they look at their hands and arms they seem to be the same kind of hands and arms they had and um the heaven that they ended up with you know might have trees and rivers and uh you know they obviously know something had happened but they don't right. necessarily put it together that they that they died and then they gradually begin to realize that oh yes this is this is the finer me this is the um, this is the template that creates the physical me and has been creating the physical me all this time. And they have all their memories. They have all their thoughts. They, you know, they function in much the same way that they do here, but with that, with greater freedom, greater expansion. And they understand their their place in the universe. They understand their place in, in the cosmos, not the universe. Um, it just kind of comes pouring in. Right. You know, understanding, intuition really just comes pouring in. And they realize, you know, why they incarnated in the first place, what they've been doing with their lives, what the heavens are. And because this is not their first rodeo, so to speak, they realized, you know, this is a more familiar home. It's more real than this uh, electric light show that is the physical universe. All these realizations come to them, but alas, when we're born, all of that knowledge goes away and we have to kind of start over. Even near death experiences are told that certain things they've been um, told by higher beings, they'll forget. They'll forget. So the question is why? Why would we choose to do this, to go from this amazing world where we have perfect memory and and, and the finer body to this world of limitation? Uh, what is What would be the purpose for us to do that? Well, it's tough to answer because yeah. as you put it, uh, I also feel it, you know, mm -hmm. why, why is why is this why? happening? Why do I have to go through this? Right. That it's. It's good to say to God, I didn't ask to be incarnated, so you got to help me get out of it. But as I understand the bigger picture, I think that's our all of our personal reaction to it varies, but is often the same. Some near death experiencers just refuse to go back. <laughs> right. They say, I, I no, and and it <laughs> takes you know increasingly more powerful divine beings to come to them to really get them to understand within themselves that they need to go back. Right. Um, so I think that understanding can be found. I think that understanding uh, exists, but it's uh, it takes time. 
So Brian, you're sort of frozen. No, uh, I, I can still hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I just right, wanted yeah. to make sure you could still hear me. Um, um, yeah, so I, it, it's been a, an, a wonderful conversation. We've covered so much and I, I probably could sit here and talk to you for several more hours. There's so many uh, more questions and, and, and you've written two amazing books that address significant, important questions for somebody that's been raised with a scientific background like myself that I, I'm constantly asking. Well, if there are people out there that are asking these questions, like if physics says this, but that I'm experiencing this, I recommend reading Joseph's books. They're amazing. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about your sci-fi fantasy series, The Protector's Diaries. Um, and so I I hope that I can have you on again. Thank you for your patience and setting up this interview and, and sharing so much knowledge. Everybody needs to get the book Break, Breaking Through the Limits of the Brain. And you can find that on Amazon. I'll make sure to put a link in the description. Also, The Physics of God is absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much, Joseph, for coming on. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Wonderful to talk with you. And welcome to the Reality Revolution. We return you now to your local announcement.